Okay, welcome back to the final session of today's um, ACIP meeting. Um, so we are going to hear from uh, Dr. Rao regarding pre-exposure prophylaxis schedule, grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation grade. Uh, Dr. Rao, it's all yours. The information on this slide was assumed by the work group before developing policy questions and evaluating the evidence for these policy questions. So rabies is 100% fatal. Rabies vaccines are highly efficacious. Multiple layers of preventing human rabies, example, PrEP, animal vaccinations for rabies, PPE while working with rabies virus, and PEP. There's multiple layers in preventing human rabies. Uh, the goal of PrEP, which is different for recognized and for unrecognized exposures. For recognized exposures, the goal is an anamnestic response from PrEP, and it results in a shortened PEP series. And for unrecognized exposures, the goal of PrEP is to maintain high titers such that protection is provided by PrEP alone, even if PEP is not administered. And then other assumptions that uh, hopefully the background presentations have uh, provided is that ID data can be used to inform IM recommendations and that an increase in titer cutoff to 0.5 IUs uh, per ml has advantages and one potential disadvantage which is that the booster could be indicated for a tighter, tighter value that would have been considered acceptable in the past. So from here, we can move on and, um, and I guess, grow, grow our discussion on uh, these topics. As a reminder, this is where we left off in my earlier presentation today. We reorganized the risk groups and labeled the risk groups number one to number four on the leftmost column from highest risk to lower risk, lowest risk. And the last two columns are what um, the remainder of our rabies presentations today will be about. So primary immunogenicity is in the first blank uh, column in this slide. It's the immunogenicity we want to see reflected in peak titers, which occur about two to four weeks after completion of a primary PrEP series. In thinking about primary immunogenicity, the work group considered the goals of primary immunogenicity for each of the three risk groups for whom PrEP is indicated, and the work group concluded that there's no difference in the goal for ensuring that titers are acceptable two to, th two to four weeks after completion of the primary series. The work group thus drafted the policy question on this slide, which we call policy question number one, and which applies to all three risk categories. The policy question is, should a two-dose pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP series involving HDCV or PCECV IM07 days replace the three-dose series IM07-21-28 days for all those for whom rabies vaccine PrEP is recommended. So the population um, for this PICO is persons for whom rabies vaccine PrEP is recommended. The intervention is the 07 days rabies vaccine PrEP schedule. And the comparison is 07, 21, 28 days rabies vaccine PrEP schedule. And then the outcomes is, is um, what we can show here on this next slide is primary immunogenicity. Uh, which is the peak immunogenicity after completion of the primary vaccine series, so about two to four weeks after completion of the primary vaccine series. Um, and you'll notice here that we did not have any safety outcomes. Um, in February, we presented to the committee um, that there really are no changes to the two rabies vaccines that are currently available. They are considered safe vaccines, and um, there's a, a record over many decades of, of that being the case. Um, and we showed the ver we, we discussed at the February meeting that uh, RCTs since the 2008 ACIP publication and VAERS data, um, both of which have shown known change from the, um, um, the few adverse events that have been reported in the past. So this is our final PICO question then, our first policy question number one, where the outcome is primary immunogenicity. So now we come to the second blank column on this table, which is long-term immunogenicity. And in considering long-term immunogenicity, the work group thought about whether the goals for long-term immunogenicity should be different for any of the three risk groups. So just to recap, those in the, in the number one risk group can have 
oops, I'm sorry, can have an unrecognized high risk and recognized exposures. That is why they are at the highest risk. Those in the number two risk group can have unrecognized and recognized exposures. And those in the number three risk group can have only recognized exposures. So what differentiates these groups in terms of recommendations is that those in the number one and number two risk groups have potential for unrecognized exposures. And as mentioned earlier today, what this means is that those persons could have exposures for which they do not seek PEP. Listed on this slide then is the grouping of those in the number one and number two risk groups and those in the number three risk groups separately um, the goals are different um, for, for people who have unrecognized and recognized risk groups. The ideal way of dealing with uh, long-term immunogenicity would be titer checks. That is already recommended uh, by ACIP for those in the number one and number two risk groups listed here. However, for the third group, it would be a new recommendation for many. Uh, the work group discussed and recognizing that persons in this group are in the third risk group, many of them are not accustomed to having even a single titer drawn. The work group wanted to consider for this group a booster as an alternative. Um, and so that is um, how, because the goal of the people in the number three risk group is an anamnestic response, that is um, part of what the work group considered. So ensuring long-term immunogenicity um, for those at risk, the data indicates in this slide is actually a study, a strategy at all from, um, from several decades ago in JID. And what I wanna point out really is this second, um, second curve here. The, on the x-axis is the time since the primary series and on the y-axis is the, pre, uh, the evolution of the seroconversion, is the seroconversion rate. And you can see in the figure heading that the evolution of the seroconversion rate or percent SCR from day 379, which is two weeks after a booster was given at the one year point to year 10. And what this um, study is showing is with the yellow arrow, arrow, that is the equivalent of the vaccine that we would use in the United States. Um, and so it's, it's like an HDCV vaccine after a two-dose vaccine series. It shows what happens over time after a booster is given at the one-year time point. And you can see that, the, that, the that there's really no decrease, that the titers remain pretty high after, um, after that booster at the one-year time point. And so the data indicates that, um, that if the titers remain that high, that the person will continue to mount an anamnestic response. And in the absence of data confirming that a zero seven days series provides immunogenicity many years later, titers at a one year time point could be um, indicative of a person's long term immunogenicity. Now, new data since this manuscript came out, actually, I think it's as recent as a year or two ago, um, found that um, that um, date that people can mount an anamnestic response after the zero three seven primary series for as long as three years later. Um, and so taken together, the work group felt that tighter value at any point during one to three years after completion of the primary series could be checked once to ensure long-term immunogenicity. And a booster could be recommended if titers are under the 0 0.5 IUs per ml um, titer cutoff, which we are um, now hoping to um, change to. And then no further titer checks would be indicated because these persons in the number three risk group have only recognized exposures, and so they're very different from the people in the first and the second risk groups who um, currently, even by the 2008 ACIP recommendations, have serial titers. Um, so the ideal way of dealing with long-term immunogenicity would be titer checks. That's already recommended, and um, you can see here that... Um, the work group um, recommended this policy question for that booster option um, as an alternative to titer, to, um, to titers for those and only the number three risk groups. So the policy question reads, should an IM booster dose of rabies vaccine, PCECV or HDCV, be recommended as an alternative to a titer check no sooner than day 21 and no later than three years after the two dose prep series, IM zero seven days, for those in the number three risk category who receive PrEP. And the population here is only persons in the number three risk category. The intervention is day number 31, sorry, day 21 to year three 
rabies vaccine booster after the zero seven days rabies vaccine prep schedule. And the comparison is no rabies vaccine booster after zero seven days rabies vaccine prep schedule. And then the outcome, again, similar to um, what I showed for the first policy question, is long-term immunogenicity only, and there were no safety outcomes. Um, and by long-term immunogenicity, we mean the ability to mount an anamnestic response in, um, in response to a challenge like a rabies virus exposure or, or a booster dose of rabies vaccine. Um, so now policy question number two, I think we've already discussed here, the evidence retrieval uh, process for answering these two, um, for, for, for gathering the information for these two was a literature search of multiple biomedical and interdisciplinary bibliographic databases, including Medline, Embase, Cochrane Library, and WHO Index Medicus. We performed a broad and rigorous, we used a very broad and rigorous strategy incorporating terms related to the concept of pre-exposure vaccination against rabies virus using HDCV or PCECV vaccines. The search was uh, for a time period of 1965 to 2018 and without language restrictions to identify potentially relevant studies. And um, 1965 is actually uh, significantly sooner than when these cell culture vaccines were available. The results were compiled in an endnote library and duplicate records were removed. And then the search was updated through um, December 31st, 2019 to ensure records not captured in the original search were included. So records were included if they presented data on human rabies vaccines and they um, involved immunocompetent adults. Um, preferably 18 years or older, included data for intervention of strategy, so HDCV or PCECV rabies vaccine, pre-exposure, intradermal or intramuscular, included data relevant to the outcome measures being assessed, and planned categorization of primary data into comparative or single-arm studies, uh, randomized control trials, uh, prospective or retrospective cohort case control, and cross-sectional studies. And this slide here shows how study selection occurred. Um, basically, uh, papers were excluded for various reasons, and we ended up with 12 articles um, that uh, fulfilled our criteria. Now, the next few slides are um, things that the committee is already familiar with, and so I'll just go, th uh, go through very quickly. Um, the grade evidence assessment criteria are listed here. Um, risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, and other considerations. And then the overall evidence type or certainty level uh, ranges from type 1 to type 4, where the type 1 is high certainty, means that we're very confident that the true effect lies close to that of the estimate of the effect. Level 2 is moderate certainty. We're moderately confident in the effect estimate. The true effect is likely to be close to the estimate of the effect, but there's a possibility that it's substantially different. Type three is our confidence in the effect estimate is limited. The true effect may be substantially different from the estimate of the effect. And then type four is very low certainty. And we have that means we have very little confidence in the effect estimate. The true effect is likely to be substantially different from the estimate of effect. Now, um, the evidence profile notes the grade was conducted as it pertains to the specific population, intervention, comparison, and outcome of interest. Randomized control trials, or RCT, refers to a trial which randomizes participants to an active intervention or placebo or unvaccinated comparator arm. Observational studies refer to one-arm studies, studies for whom participants were not randomized, or studies that did not provide disaggregated data to allow for the comparison between randomized arms. And evidence was considered observational if only data from the study arm or arms involving one of the US vaccines were included. So I'll start now with um, the outcome for the PrEP policy question number one. And as a reminder, this is that first policy question with primary immunogenicity being the outcome. Um, and so these are, I'm going to start by presenting the studies in our systematic review that were RCTs. Our search identified two RCTs that compared a two-dose to a three-dose primary series. Across both studies, 100% of participants met the outcome of interest. There was unclear reporting of randomization and allocation concealment in both trials that led to some concerns of risk of bias, which you can see in the last column of this table. 
This forest plot shows the analysis of the two studies reporting on our outcome of immunogenicity, comparing the two-dose to the three-dose series. The first analysis displays the results from IM administration, and the second displays the results from ID administration. The results taken together are listed below these. Uh, there was no heterogeneity due to the route of administration, um, as shown here. And the pooled risk ratio is 1.00 with a confidence interval from 0.99 to 1.01. .01. So very tight, as shown by the diamond to the right. Our search identified 10 additional studies that compared a two-dose to a three-dose primary series, and these studies were treated as observational ones, although they were originally designed as randomized trials. In um, this meta-analysis, we broke the randomization to extract pertinent data, um, and that's why they were considered observational. Quality of the studies were evaluated with the Newcastle-Ottawa scale, and minimal concerns were identified in three studies, and no concerns identified in the rest. So as far as the concerns that, the, uh, that we saw in those three studies, um, cohort representativeness of the target population was not ideal in the subterranean population where it was predominantly children. Participants not demonstrated to be free from outcome of interest at start of the study. Um, there were no day zero titers for Kramer and subterranean, both of those papers. Um, there was inadequate follow-up time to assess outcome potentially in the Kramer paper where the follow-up was one week after the completion of the series rather than about two to four weeks after completion, when, which is when we would expect to see peak titers. And there was potentially a loss to follow-up for the Catella paper because we don't know if anyone was lost to follow-up based on uh, the manuscript itself and had to assume that everyone finished the day 28 time point. Across these studies, 95.9% of participants met the outcome of interest after a Tudo series, and 97.9% of participants met the outcome of interest after a three-do series. The forest plot shows the analysis of the 10 studies we treated as observational, reporting on our outcome of immunogenicity comparing the two-dose to the three-do series. And similar to the previous forest plot I presented, the first analysis displays the results from IM administration, and the second displays the results from ID administration, and there was no heterogeneity due to the route of administration. Um, there's no suspicion for heterogeneity. The I square is 0% here. And the pooled risk ratio is 1.00 with, again, a very tight confidence interval of 0.99 to 1.00. Now, this is the evidence profile of the grade assessment for the outcome of immunogenicity as measured by a titer at or above 0.5 IUs per ml. We've assessed the body of evidence from RCTs and non-randomized studies separately because of concerns with unclear reporting of randomization and allocation concealment. We rated the RCTs down for risk of bias, but we had no other concerns for the certainty of the evidence, and therefore we have moderate certainty um, or certainty level two about immunogenicity for the RCTs, 264 persons in the two-dose arm and the three-dose arm achieved 100% seroconversion. Now, um, the relative risk is, um, it, the relative risk is one and the conference interval is 0 0.99 to 1.01, and the absolute effect is no fewer Per one per one thousand zero convert in the two dose arm compared to the three dose arm, and that ranges from ten fewer persons to ten more. Now the second line of this table is uh, shows our certainty in the evidence of immunogenicity of the non-randomized studies. We had no concerns about the evidence and therefore remained at low certainty that the observational study started at that is a level three. And I'll now move on to the outcomes for the PrEP policy question number two. And again, this is that policy question with long-term immunogenicity being the outcome. For policy question number two, we abstracted data from uh, two of the same papers, the Endy and Sunjin studies. To obtain these data, we broke up the randomization and treated them as observational studies 
So per policy question number two, the comparison group comprises of people who did not receive a booster after a two-dose primary series. In these two studies, there was no direct comparison group. Grade was performed in the absence of a comparison group. Quality of the studies were evaluated with the Newcastle Ottawa scale and minimal concerns were identified as shown in the last column. Concerns for risk of bias include adequate follow-up time to assess outcome as titers were drawn seven days after the booster. This is the evidence profile of the grade assessment for the outcome of duration of immunogenicity as measured by a titer at or above 0.5 IUs per ml after booster. The best available evidence was informed by the single arms of two trials, which demonstrated a complete achievement of immunogenicity following a two-dose primary series, as well as after a booster provided. Um, therefore, it was treated as non-randomized and started a low certainty or level three evidence. We had no additional concerns with the body of evidence, so the certainty difference between the level of immunogenicity achieved between three weeks and three years among persons who received a booster compared to those receiving a two-dose primary series. And these are all the 12 manuscripts that we used um, for this and the, the subsequent slides that the committee should have um, in their slide deck include the appendices for, for both policy questions. Thank you. So we'll take a moment here. Uh, thank you for that excellent presentation, Terrell. And let's see if there are any questions from uh, the um, voting members and from the liaisons. Um, I thought I saw a hand go up there. Dr. Bell. Yes, thank you. I, I first of all just want to say that uh, congratulate everyone on these extremely helpful, very clear, very comprehensive presentations about a very complicated and difficult subject with when you have something with a 100% fatality rate and uh, doesn't <laughs> and very limited information. It, it's really been um, extremely well done. I just have one question about the um, second policy question, which is sort of a feasibility logistical question. If I'm understanding correctly, the, op the, the option is either a booster dose or a, a, a titer with a, you know, a relatively loose timing for both. Um, and I'm just wondering what um, your thinking is about why it would be easier to get someone to come in for a booster dose rather than having their blood drawn. Or is there something else about the difference between these two options that I'm missing? Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, for there, there are differences. So some people, we actually discussed this on the work group, and there were very differences in there were big differences in opinion, and we went back and forth between saying tighter only, booster only, and then eventually settled on giving both options. So um, the tighter option, the thing is, is that we don't know with the two-dose series how many people would, would subsequently require a booster because their titer is under 0.5 IUs per ml. We think it would be more people than would currently need um, a booster aft at the one-year point um, with the three-dose series, but we can't say for sure, given the lack of, like, lack of data, how many people would be. Um, even if it were up to 50% or 60% of people, uh, the discussion on the work group calls was that a titer, some people might find annoying to have to get a titer and then to uh, make another appointment to get a booster. And um, they thought that since the current schedule is for a three dose series, that it would just, some people would consider it uh, a preferable option to go straight to um, the third dose. Um, and the, the reason for the, the, the broad time period for that third dose is partly based on the fact that the current three-dose series can be, the third, the third dose is at day 21 or day 28. And so we know that that is effective in um, ensuring long-term immunogenicity. And then we have data um, going all the way out to three years that says that people continue to have an anamnestic response at three years. Um, and that's why we uh, felt comfortable with saying a booster at any point in that time point time period. Um, the work group's suspicion is actually that probably even beyond three years, there is long-term immunogenicity from this two-dose series. And WHO actually adopted the two-dose series without any additional uh, requirements for a titer or for a booster or for anything. 
Um, and so we're just taking the most conservative route given the limited data, the data only up until three years um, to ensure that people get either a tighter or a booster option and that people's um, convenience and preference and all that is honored as much as possible. Um, a tighter, if you're paying for it out of pocket, um, is only about $50, whereas going straight to booster can be as much as $1,800 for um, okay. the doctor's visit. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Answers my question. Dr. Paling. Um, thank you. Uh, I very much appreciate this very clear presentation. I wanted to follow up on Dr. Bell's question. Um, I believe I understood that Kansas State University is one of three places that do titers. And so I wanted to ask about the availability of obtaining a titer. Yeah, so thank you. sure, thank you. Um, so the, it's true that um, KSU is one of the places, and uh, Atlanta Health Associates and CDC, and um, currently with the current um, current three dose schedule, people who are immunocompromised um, always have to. Get, I mean, people end up getting multiple titers drawn because after a three dose series is for healthy people, and then they need to get a titer repeatedly until that they until that's been achieved. Um, and as I hopefully was clear about in the earlier presentation today, um, it's already a requirement for people in the continuous and in the frequent risk groups to get titers drawn serially at um, certain intervals. For those in the number one risk group, it's every six months. For people in the number two risk group, it's every two years. And we moved a, a huge section of the people who had previously been in that number two risk group to the number three risk group. Um, and so a good portion of those people were already supposed to be getting titers every two years from the people that were now asking to get a single titer once. Um, and so we, we just don't anticipate that it's going to be an increase in the number of titers, given that so many people already are getting um, titers, either because they're immunocompromised or because they're in the high-risk groups. Dr. Talbot. I have two questions. The first one, did I hear you correctly that it's $1,600 per shot? Um, what we've been told is with the clinic visit and the shot together is about $1,800 or so. How much is this vaccine cost? Uh, I, I guess I, I don't know. I can't tease that out. But um, the pharmaceutical people are probably on the call. Um, yeah. Can either one of them answer? Yes. Could somebody from the pharmaceutical company please Answer that question if you have the information readily available. This is Ryan Wallace with CDC, not the pharmaceutical company, but I can tell you the Medicare reimbursement cost for one dose of rabies vaccine is $303. Thank you. That's a big difference. Thank you very much. All right, so my second question is, do we have any data on how compliant people are about getting their booster shots slash um, antibody titers being drawn? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I did include in the uh, background reading um, some of these two manuscripts that talk a little bit about this. And we actually feel that the uh, compliance with uh, titers for those in the number one risk group is 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 per, is great because those folks are laboratorians. Their jobs require it. These people have jobs like um, like laboratorians at CDC and research labs and all. And so it's kind of an occupational health issue that's enforced for them to get their titers drawn every six months and a booster subsequently in order for them to continue working in the lab. For the people in the number two risk group, um, the the um, people aren't as good about uh, being compliant with the ACIP recommendations as they stand now. Um, the um, there used to be veterinarians and all who work in terrestrial rabies regions who were listed in that number two risk group, and uh, as I mentioned, we moved those to the number three risk group, but. Um, they're good about getting the titer checked immediately after, like, because they get the vaccine during veterinary school. Um, they're good about getting that, that check as part, because it's a requirement before they complete vet school. And so that two-year check they're compliant with. But then subsequently when they're in practice, um, the manuscripts say this, but also just uh, our work group members who are veterinarians and who deal with um, public health uh, veterinary practice, uh, public health veterinarians, they feel very strongly that 
that people are not at all compliant with the, the um, tighter checks beyond uh, vet school. And for those who are animal wildlife workers and um, others who fell into that group who were supposed to get titers, it's even worse. Um, it doesn't seem to be uh, enforced by their occupations, and it's really left up to the person. And because insurance doesn't cover for pre-exposure prophylaxis, it ends up being an out-of-pocket cost. So anything that can be done to maintain uh, the protection that we intend for it to provide, but to um, increase, I guess, acceptability and the ability to pay for it out-of-pocket is going to be um, a good thing. Thank you for those answers. Um, any other questions from the voting members or the liaisons before we move on to the next topic? I'm not seeing any. All right. Then, uh, Dr. Rao, um, final topic for the day is uh, summary and... Two more, actually. Sorry, I'm sorry. Evidence uh, to recommendations framework. For, forgive me. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so this is just a reminder of what the first policy question was. It is should a two dose series, um, should a two dose pre exposure prophylaxis series replace a three dose uh, series uh, for all those for whom rabies vaccine prep is recommended? And here is that um, PICO. Um, just to explain a little bit about the problem here. So rabies is nearly always fatal. PrEP is an important component of preventing human rabies in the US, but it is not the only component. It's indicated for persons with rabies risk greater than that of the general population. And PrEP is critically important for persons who have certain um, uh, higher risk than those of the general population. And those include unusual exposures, unrecognized exposures, frequent exposures to potentially rabid animals, and then travel abroad to canine rabies endemic regions without quick access to PEP. There are no cases of rabies that have occurred among persons who received modern cell culture vaccine PrEP in the US. ACIP has recommended PrEP for decades. Many persons for whom ACIP recommends PrEP do not receive it, as we just discussed. It's expensive. Insurance typically doesn't cover the cost. Occupations often do not cover the cost or even enforce um, the tighter checks or even the pre-exposure series, even though ACIP recommends it. So for the first um, question here, pre-exposure prophylaxis for rabies is the problem of public health importance. Uh, PrEP is indicated for many persons in the US, all US animal care professionals like veterinarians, technicians, and animal control officers, veterinary students, short-term and volunteer workers with hands-on animal care, persons who frequently handle bats or enter high-density bat environments, and various laboratory personnel and travelers to canine rabies endemic regions who may not have quick and easy access to PEP if needed are the populations. Fewer people receive PrEP than ACIP recommends because series involve, the series involves three vaccine doses and is often out of pocket. And so the work group um, looked at this question and felt that the problem is yes of public health importance. So how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects? Out of 264 persons receiving the two-dose primary series, 100% achieved titers greater than or equal to 0.5 IUs per ml two to four weeks after that second dose, which is when we would uh, expect peak titers. 100% of 264 persons receiving three-dose primary series achieved a, a titer level greater than uh, 0.5 IUs per ml. Zero conversion is the target outcome of PrEP and is achieved with a proposed two-dose series, just as it is with a 0, 7, 28, 21, 28 day series. And so regarding this question, uh, the work group uh, felt that the desirable anticipated effects are minimal because um, it's pretty much equivocal to the uh, current three-dose series, uh, a two-dose series is. How substantial are the undesirable anticipated effects? Well, there's no expected safety concerns associated with these uh, cell culture vaccines. And as I previously mentioned, the safety data compiled from VAERS reports for HDCV and PCECV vaccines, as well as the adverse events mentioned in the packet ins insert and those uh, reported in 25 trials 
published since the 2008 ACIP recommendations show really unchanged um, profile, safety profile, and it's considered these rabies vaccines that are used in the U.S. or have been used for decades and are considered to have a favorable safety profile. And so we felt that the undesirable anticipated effects are minimal. So uh, weighing these out, do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects? Both a two-dose and a three-dose primary series achieve complete immunogenicity at two to four weeks following completion of the series. We feel that it favors both. Overall certainty of the evidence, there was a moderate certainty of the evidence or a level two due to concerns for risk of bias. Moderate certainty of evidence, moderate, level two. Does the target population feel that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects? There's actually no research evidence identified. The target population would likely appreciate a shorter series that requires fewer vaccines, is less expensive, and provides the same primary immunogenicity as the current three-dose series. There would probably need to be educational materials so that there isn't any concern or question from the target audience about whether um, they're getting less protection or, or anything like that, but they do need to keep in mind that um, given the lack of data to confirm that there is protection beyond the three-year time period, that this two-dose uh, series is really um, only now intended for people uh, up until that three-year time point, and maybe CAP surveys could be considered to assess the perceptions of the target population to confirm that they do indeed uh, find the desirable effects um, outweigh those undesirable ones. And the work group felt that the answer was probably yes. Is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes? Uh, again, there's no like research evidence identified, but the target population does value protection from rabies, and there's likely no important variable uh, variability in how people value it. And so the work group said that there is no important uncertainty or variability. Is the intervention acceptable to key stakeholders? A shorter series would be appreciated by clinical providers, public health officials, and patients who all prefer a simpler vaccine schedule that is less expensive than the current schedule. It'll also be easier to schedule appointments for two vaccines than for the current three-dose series. And so the work group felt that yes, um, the intervention is acceptable to key stakeholders. Is the intervention a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources? It's as the estimated cost of a three-dose prep series is approximately eighteen thousand dollars for um, for a clinic visit plus a vaccine. Um, these costs are often out of pocket. Fewer costs would be incurred by patients with a shorter series and therefore making the intervention a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources to all populations for which it's indicated. Um, and rabies vaccine shortages have occurred in the US. A shorter vaccine schedule may prevent an impact of those uh, shortages on PrEP demands. And so the work group felt that the answer was yes to whether this was an intervention that is a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. What would be the impact on health equity? There's no research evidence identified. The cost for rabies prep, again, is out of pocket. Shorter series could potentially make prep more accessible to persons who would not otherwise be able to afford it. And we do know, as I mentioned earlier, that there's a lot of people that ACIP recommends receive um, receive PrEP who don't, who don't um, like animal care workers and all, and um, they do have an increased risk than the general population, and so we feel that it would probably be reduced any uh, impact on health equity. Is the intervention feasible to implement? There's, again, no research evidence identified, but there's no barrier expected to implement a shorter series. With a three-dose series, it's often difficult to ensure the third dose is administered before someone, for example, goes on a trip uh, to a canine rabies endemic region or starts work, having to wait until uh, receiving that third dose or 21 or 28 days is often seen as an inconvenience and uh, people don't see themselves as being previously immunized before receiving that third dose. 
But now um, with this shorter dose, zero, seven days, they would be uh, considered previously immunized much sooner. And as, as many people on our work group um, commented, um, travelers often do not schedule clinic visit, uh, travel clinic visit is soon enough before their travel. And um, this would facilitate that. Um, the management challenges expected, um, you know, because there's deviations in schedules and what have you are, are going to be equivocal to those currently faced when deviations occur in prep schedules. And so uh, the work group felt, yes, the intervention is feasible to implement. The balance of consequences here, the desirable consequences probably outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings. And um, is there sufficient information to move forward with the recommendation? The work group felt that yes, there is. And so this is the, the recommendation that the uh, work group wants to propose to the committee. In persons for whom rabies vaccine prep is indicated, ACIP recommends a two-dose prep series IM07 days involving HDCV or PCECV rather than a three-dose prep series IM07 21, 28 days and the work group's preference is for the intervention. Now moving on to the second policy question, should an IM booster dose of rabies vaccine, PCECV or HDCV be recommended as an alternative to a titer check no sooner than day 21 and no later than three years after the two dose pre-exposure prophylaxis prep series IM 07 days for those in the number three risk category who receive PrEP. And again, here is the PICO, the long-term immunogenicity is what we worry about here. Uh, I do want to point out that this second question really is only applicable to people who would have sustained risk for rabies beyond the three-year time point. So, for example, if someone is a traveler who is going to do a one-and-done trip to um, to India or to somewhere like that, and they, they want to get pre-exposure prophylaxis for that trip, then this question would not even apply. Um, and similarly, if someone is doing a, a summer work for a summer involving animals and has that increased risk and then never, decides to not pursue a, a career in that area, then um, just that two-dose pre-exposure prophylaxis series would be needed, and this recommendation would not apply. Now, the problem uh, is that some persons have sustained risk for rabies, so risk for rabies greater than three years after completion of the primary series. For those in the number one and number two risk groups for rabies, serial titer checks is already currently recommended by ACIP because of the risk to those groups for unrecognized exposures. And so the, the desire is to keep those titers as high above 0 0.5, or well, at 0 0.5 IU per ml. Um, you know, long term um, to account for the potential for unrecognized exposures. And in the absence of data to confirm long term immunogenicity beyond three years after the primary series, a titer check or a booster for those in the number three risk group can, can confirm long term immunogenicity. And so a single titer check um, is something that we will talk about in our next, the next presentation, exactly at what time point the single titer check should be given. But based on the data that I've presented so far, I hope it's clear that the work group was considering any time point between one and three years after the primary series um, based on the data, uh, that, that, that that would be uh, acceptable. And the recommendation for a titer check, though, for this group would be a new ACIP recommendation for many of the people in the number three risk group, but not all of them, because some of them um, had formerly been in the number two risk group uh, because they were working in terrestrial rabies regions. Um, some persons in the number three risk group may prefer the booster to the titer check because the titer is much less costly than a booster. However, a titer may indicate need for a booster, and so some person's preference may be to go straight away to the booster so as to avoid the inconvenience of multiple clinic visits, especially if they are getting that cost paid for by their job or, or money is not of concern. So facilitating the booster dose as soon as when the third dose of the current ACIP series is administered um, is something that the work group decided to offer in order to um, basically for it to amount to no change from the current ACIP series. The fact that we're saying that a booster needs to be given 
Um, and that is why um, the booster recommendation is for a time period ranging as, as soon as day 21 and as late as three years. Uh, facilitating the booster dose as soon as when the third, um, as, yeah, it will amount to no change for those accustomed to that schedule. Provided, providing flexibility for when the booster dose can be given, i.e. up to three years, may be appreciated by recipients. Some may not know whether they will have risk for long-term immunogenicity and may prefer waiting for three years to receive the additional dose. And some may not be able to receive the third dose for an extended time period because of travel and will appreciate having a larger time um, to get that third dose in. And then, as I mentioned earlier, WHO did approve just the zero seven day series without booster in their most recent recommendations. This idea of ensuring long term immunogenicity beyond three years is is something that our work group um, pursued because of uh, recognizing that that rabies is one hundred percent fatal, and we wanted to be as conservative as possible and work within the confines of the very limited data that um, we have for rabies. Um, just uh, finally, I mean, the data about immunogenicity may be, may be coming uh, down the pike in the, next com in the coming years. Europe has already, WHO has been using this two-dose series without any option of a booster, and so we hope that there will be data from there. But also, if the policy question is recommended by ACIP, then the recommendation um, facilitates the collection of data in the U.S. before the next update of ACIP recommendations in 10 years or sooner than that, um, particularly among the number one risk group, among laboratorians at CDC, but also in veterinarians um, if we collaborate with vet schools and um, if we can form collaborations with various professional societies and, and have access to titers. If the data does end up showing that a zero seven day series provides long-term immunogenicity, um, alone and that there's no need for a titer or booster to ensure long-term immunogenicity, then it would be very easy. This could be uh, a step in the right direction. It would be pretty easy to just drop um, everything that we're saying needs to be done for long-term immunogenicity, and the primary series would be as simple as WHO's. Um, the series would just be a 07 series for both primary and long-term. Um, uh, ETR, then, is the problem of public health importance. Uh, many persons in number three risk category may require long-term immunogenicity, like a career veterinarian, uh, while the two-dose series may provide long-term immunogenicity in the absence of data to confirm this, a titer check to determine if the booster is needed or a booster straight away provides the added insurance for this nearly 100% fatal illness. Allowing for the option of the booster straight away is important because for some persons in the target population, it's preferable to save time to bypass the tiger, titer and go directly to the booster. And for these persons, cost is typically absorbed by their occupation. And so the work group felt that, yes, this is a problem of public health importance. How substantial are the desirable anticipated effects? An anamnestic response to vaccine challenge as measured by increase in antibody titer level greater than or equal to 0.5 IUs per ml occurred for 100% of persons who received rabies vaccine booster at the one year time point and three year time point. And these time points are markers of long term immunogenicity. We suspect persons who receive two dose, the two dose zero seven day series will be able to mount an anamnestic response many years later, regardless of the booster. But for a high stakes infection like this, in the absence of data to confirm long term immunogenicity beyond the three year time point, the desirable effects are moderate. How substantial are the undesirable anticipated effects? There's no expected safety concerns associated with the booster dose. As I mentioned earlier, people who are immunocompromised um, have any other reason to their being concerned about whether or not they they were responsive to the vaccine, end up getting a lot of titers and a lot of boosters. Safety data compiled, as mentioned earlier, shows that the safety profile is good and um, uh, yeah, it's the favorable safety profile, and in fact, um, um, additional doses of rabies vaccine actually results in fewer, fewer adverse events based on some data. So we feel that the undesirable anticipated effects are minimal. Uh, do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable? Well, 100% response rate among those uh, receiving a booster, and there's likely few additional adverse events from receipt of the booster. And therefore, we, we said it favors the intervention. 
Effectiveness of the intervention, the, the grade table showed low certainty evidence or level three, which is shown here. Um, does the target population feel that the desirable effects are large relative to undesirable effects? The target population likely wants to ensure long-term immunogenicity. And given the limit, limited data that two-dose series alone will provide that long-term immunogenicity, we expect the benefits to outweigh any inconvenience. Uh, persons who may experience, persons may experience the less anxiety about acquiring this high mortality infection by having the option of a booster or titer. And some persons may experience discomfort though or inconvenience of having to get a booster. So there's potentially that uh, downside. We thought that the target population would find the desirable effects probably um, large relative to the undesirable. Is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes? There's no research evidence identified, but the target population likely desires prep a PrEP series that provides long-term immunogenicity. There's no important uncertainty or variability because the target population is at increased risk for exposure to a life-threatening illness. Is the intervention acceptable to key stakeholders? There's no research evidence identified, but stakeholders are invested in ensuring the target population has long-term immunogenicity for rabies. Stakeholders accustomed to accommodating for a third dose of rabies vaccine, um, they are already accustomed to this, and so they might find it acceptable to have the tighter option or the booster dose proposed after the propo after, provided after the proposed 07 days primary series, and so we feel that this intervention is acceptable, yes, to key stakeholders. Is the intervention a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources? Uh, while the cost of rabies booster and appointment, as I mentioned, can be very high, while the cost of the titer alone is, if you look at the KSU website, $50, and if you're going to figure in maybe additional costs and all, it's still going to be a whole lot less than, than the cost of the actual booster. However, given added, the added insurance the booster would give for long-term immunogenicity would be reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. And since not all persons who receive the primary two-dose series will require a booster, tighter checks confirming tighter is greater than 0.5 IUs per ml would be less costly and could be used to avoid a booster. Um, we feel that the intervention is, yes, a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. What would be the impact on health equity? There's no research evidence identified. The cost for rabies prep is often out of pocket. There's a potential for inequity because of the high cost of vaccine. But because titer is offered as an alternative to the booster, the inequity could be resolved by choosing the titer option, which is many times less expensive. And so we said uh, we don't know whether there would be an impact on health equity. Is the intervention feasible to implement? Administrators of the booster are accustomed to accommodating multiple doses of PrEP beyond the 07-day series for immunocompromising conditions or any other reason. They will not have difficulty with feasibility of booster dose after a two-dose series. Recommending the booster may improve feasibility of maintaining occupational compliance with rabies PrEP recommendations from ACIP. Um, and so that could be a good thing. Um, and so we feel that it is feasible to implement. The balance of consequences, we feel desirable consequences clearly outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings. And regarding there being sufficient information to move it forward with a recommendation, um, the work group felt yes. And this is our draft recommendation for those in the number three risk category for rabies with sustained risk for rabies. ACIP recommends an IM booster dose of rabies vaccine PCCV or HDCV as an alternative to a titer check no sooner than day 21, but no later than three years after the two-dose PrEP series, IM 07 days. Uh, and that is all. Thank you very much for that presentation. Are there any questions? And while everybody's getting their hand up, I do have one. And I'm sorry I don't have a slide number. But on um, your intervention, uh, whether it was reasonable, um, you listed a, a cost of $18,000. 1800 I think it was 18000 Okay. 522. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
think that was a um, typo. Yeah, sorry, eighteen hundred. Yeah, so I bring that to your attention. Oh, no, eighteen. No, no, no. Go, go. The other series. There's okay. another one in there where it's eighteen thousand dollars. Okay, we'll correct that for sure. Okay, thank you. I think I heard Dr. Atmar say it was at slide twenty-two, but you can look at that later. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Kimberlin. I'm David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. I, I, I was going to ask the same question, but but it, it, it can't be $1,800 because the other slide said one dose was $1,800. So can we, I, I, my, my, my issue here is I, I'm continuing to struggle, I think, as as I believe the ACIP did at the February meeting with what the rash, what the real rationale is for decreasing the number of doses from three to two. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to think, well, is it money? And certainly 18,000 versus 1,800 wasn't making sense. I, I'm just, I'm still struggling with that. Yeah, so sorry, this is the slide and it should be 1,800, but uh, the, the bullet says that the difference between a three dose and a two dose would be an $1,800 cost, which, which is basically the cost of one dose of the vaccine. Um, so the, one of the zeros is extra, but it's, it's, it's like the difference between getting a two dose series compared to the current three dose schedule could amount to $1,800. As far as like what the actual uh, benefit of making all these changes are, I actually have in the next presentation some information about that. If I fail to answer that question properly, do you mind asking that question again? Happy to do so, thank you. Thanks. Dr. Bell. Well, sorry, I, I maybe should wait for the next presentation also. I was just gonna suggest on this cost question that it, it might be useful for you guys to uh, just do a little bit more investigating about precisely what the cost of a dose of rabies vaccine is in various settings, private sector, et cetera, that that would be helpful. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask about is um, the slide that you just showed towards the end of your current presentation with the proposed wording for the policy question number two. Um, do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, I think it's probably yeah. the, the last slide. Maybe it's the last slide, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, just no. to make a, oh, well, wait. Sorry, that was for the first policy question. I think oh, you're- Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I am asking about the last one. It's really a small point. I don't want to hold things up, so- Here it is. too hard, we can- um, Here it is. Yeah, so just not that, um, we, not for now necessarily, but just to sort of clarify things when we get to the voting. I just want to make sure that it's clear with the wording here that there are two options. One is to get a booster dose, the other is to get a titer. And um, to me, it's not entirely clear that, you know, that essentially either is okay. Um, so just, you maybe want to work on the wording a little bit. I may be the only person that's a little bothered by the wording, but I'm just mentioning that. Sounds good, thanks. One um, thing about this is that apparently titer checks, frequency of titer checks is not something that requires a vote. It doesn't require a grade or an ETR. And so that is one of the reasons that we uh, struggled. Uh, the work group had thought, well, titer only, and then there was not gonna really, it was gonna end up being clinical guidance. Then we went with booster, that was gonna be a cleaner um, question and, and type of recommendation. And now that we're offering both as options, um, it's true that only the booster part needs to be actually voted on and the tighter part would just be clinical guidance. Thank okay. you for that question. Nonetheless, the recommendation, be, it would be good for the recommendation to be clear about what exactly we're saying about what people's options are. Okay, thanks. Thank uh, and I think about your first question, you had asked about the cost. I think I might... Sorry, in my next presentation, uh, again, if you could bring that up if, if I don't answer it well. Dr. McNally, I'm oh, sorry, Ms. McNally. Thank you. I just wanted to, um, to let you know that I agree with Dr. Bell's comments. I think just, again, from the consumer perspective, it would be helpful to have that clarity. Dr. Sanchez. Yeah, um, Papa, so... I just a minor thing. How about intradermal? Did I miss something? 
Yeah, so intradermal is not something that we're recommending in the U.S., and we haven't recommended it for a very long time. Um, as Dr. Briggs presented in her slides, um, intradermal was licensed briefly in the United States, but um, companies pulled out of, of providing it for intradermal purposes. Now, it's specially packaged for intradermal, um, and so if it's not licensed for it by FDA, there poses a lot of infection control issues um, for using a single-use vial for multiple pa multiple people. It, it makes sense from a cost savings perspective internationally, which is why WHO um, endorses it. But within the U.S. population, given how rarely um, it's going to be used, and the risks uh, from the infection control standpoint, and the fact that it's not FDA licensed or packaged currently for U for the U.S., um, we're not we're not providing any ACIP recommendations for intradermal and haven't for a very long time. The purpose of Dr. Briggs's presentation was more to explain why we had included intradermal studies in our grade. Thank you. Are there any que questions from the liaisons? All right, let's move on to the um, final topic, which is uh, summary and next step steps by Dr. Rao, please. Okay. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, this, going back to the table of the risk groups and the PrEP recommendations, um, we can now fill in um, some of this information. And so for primary immunogenicity, this could be the IM07 day schedule. That is policy question number one, if the work group, uh, sorry, if the committee um, votes on it that way. And then we can also fill in the long-term immunogenicity column for the booster dose for those in the number three risk category, uh, which was policy question number two. And that booster would then be an option. Um, what we still have to fill out is the frequency of titer checks, which is highlighted in yellow on this slide. And what the committee decided was that um, the titers are, ch are checked every six months uh, for those in the number one risk group already. Uh, ACIP already recommends that. And every two years for those in the number two risk group. And so um, the only difference, the only new thing would be the titer once at a specific time point uh, for those in the number three risk group. And again, going back to that Strady et al. article that I referred to uh, in a previous presentation, um, since the the um, tighter sorry the tighters or the the tighter level at um, at one year or thereabouts is indicative of uh, long term immunogenicity or long term ability to mount an anamnestic response. The um, work group felt that that data coupled with the fact that uh, an anamnestic response is clear from the randomized control trials as far as three years after three years um, after completion of the primary series that we could uh, recommend a tighter level at a specific time point rather than um, yeah, we could recommend a, a specific time point between one and three years. And the work group opted for that tighter to be at two years just so that we were consistent with the time point for the tighter checks for those in the number two risk group. And then no further titers would be needed for those in the number three risk group because, as previously mentioned, the, the, the reason for uh, PrEP for those in the number three risk group is just the ability to mount an anamnestic response. And so the titers need not be very high the way that they are for people who have unrecognized exposures, the people in, in, in groups one and two. And so that is what you see here in the red box filled out, a titer once at two years after the primary series and a booster if the titer is less than 0.5 IUs per ml. Now, the, a summary of the proposed clinical guidance that we are suggesting um, today uh, from all the presentations, we updated the table for the risk groups. We reorganized the risk groups for PrEP and the titles of the three risk groups based on the changing rabies landscape. We included biogeography information for each risk group to make it easier to navigate and to clear up a lot of the questions that, that have been problems um, for clinicians and uh, public health uh, folks as they've been trying to use that table. And we provided more examples of the occupations for each risk group um, so that there is as little confusion as possible. Um, also, clinical guidance to ensure long-term immunogenicity, a titer was introduced as an option for persons in the number three risk group at two years. 
And this is clinical guidance, and no, so not something that grade or ETR or vote would be needed for. And then as Dr. Moore presented, uh, we're proposing changing the ACIP cutoff uh, for minimum an uh, acceptable antibody titer to 0.5 IUs per ml. And moving on to the, the proposed uh, changes that the work group is um, suggesting for that would require a vote. Um, we are, for primary immunogenicity, suggesting that the three-dose series be shortened to a two-dose series, and then um, that in addition to the tighter option, an option be given for booster uh, once for the people in the number three risk group no sooner than day 21 and no later than three years. So, sorry, in the eyes of the work group, um, to answer, answer, I think it was Dr. Sanchez who asked, um, or, or sorry, uh, Red Book, you had asked, uh, asked why, um, what is the advantages of this? And so really what this comes down to is, is for the number one risk group, you're getting one less dose of pre-exposure vaccine. You're also um, assured that you have uh, vaccination in the short term um, as quickly as, you know, just so much sooner than if you had to get a third dose at 21 or 28 days. And there's no change to the fact that you're getting titers every six months. So there's really only benefits for those who are laboratorians. Now for the number two risk group, um, it's the same thing. You're getting fewer uh, vaccine doses in the primary series and your titers every two years is the same as what is currently recommended. Um, if anything, we're actually decreasing the number of people who have to get this because we are limiting the number two risk group to people who have unrecognized exposures and those are people who handle bats or enter high density bat environments. It's a very small number of people. Um, and then the, the number three risk group is um, the IM07 days, again, a two-dose series that, um, that people will love to get. Um, and then if you don't have sustained risk for rabies, you wouldn't even have to get a titer or a booster or anything beyond that two-dose series. And if you do have um, um, concern, if you do have risk for long-term exposure because of your career uh, or your, your um, recreational activities, then the option of um, getting a booster allows you to get that booster as soon as when you would if it was a three-dose series. And so we're really just offering flexibility for people about how late they can get that booster. Um, and then we're also offering the option of the tighter for people who would prefer um, the lower costs and maybe making it more available to people who wouldn't already get it. And um, um, uh, yeah, so we are potentially... No, no downfalls, I guess, to this. Um, so um, the work group considerations throughout this, I just want to re repeat this again, is that we were very mindful of the, the concerns raised by the ACIP committee during the February meeting about making any change uh, to the ACIP recommendations for rabies. We know that, um, that well, we do want to point out, though, that the ACIP recommendations over time have changed quite a lot. There were many, many doses, as Dr. Briggs mentioned. And as more and more data has come out, we've been able to fine tune. And as cell culture vaccines have been um, widely used, we've been able to uh, decrease the number of doses. The 2008 recommendations, though, um, as, as you all mentioned in February, have been effective. Um, rabies is nearly 100% fatal, and so we understand that the, the request was to ensure that any proposed changes were supported by robust data, uh, addressed the evolving rabies landscape, reflected um, uh, new data, and increased confidence in moderate cell culture vaccines, and did not, was not suboptimal to what is uh, currently provided by the, by the, the three-dose PrEP series. And um, we also know that we don't need to follow what WHO followed, uh, that recommends. But we as a work group, I guess, felt that uh, what we're proposing satisfies all of that and that the increased costs that are associated with um, the tighter or the booster for those in the number three risk group is actually not much, given that many of those people were in the number two risk group and were supposed to be getting tighters um, anyway. Um, uh, as far as next steps go, we could potentially, depending upon what the work group thinks about what we've proposed, have a vote on this prep, uh, these two prep policy questions in February. And we do anticipate beginning to uh, present about post-exposure prophylaxis to ACIP um, in February. 
uh, to acknowledge all of these people. I also want to point out uh, two people who are not listed on this slide, Dr. Stiebermer and Dr. Uh, Zahn, who um, put an extensive amount of work this past weekend <laughs> in helping us with these slides. Thank you. We're now open for questions. Um, Dr. Kimberlin, your hand is up, or is that a leftover from the previous question session? Pardon, that was a uh, that was a leftover. I'll lower it now. Thank you, sir. Just making sure. Is that the same for you, uh, Ms. McNally, or do you have another question? It was leftover. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to say thank you for the outstanding presentations. Um, I also wanted to just uh, highlight that I think it's really important that we um, are thoughtful about how um, the, the dynamic uh, benefit risk balance can change. And I think it's a great thing that we're actually trying to streamline and you know continuing to improve, um, maximize effectiveness while also minimizing any harms or uh, challenges to uh, hearing to these recommendations. So I think it's a really great step forward and I'm glad uh, the work group has pursued this and is bringing it to ACIP, so thank you. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Um, yes, thank you. I thank you very much for this presentation. I wanted to go back a few slides to one of the last ones where we had the three boxes. That's the one. Okay, and my question, um, so um, my question is for group number three. And it, the way the PICO question was worded, I didn't exactly understand it this way. Um, my question is, if you don't get the titer at two years, is your only choice a booster? Or um, could you, should we say a titer once between two and three years? Yeah, no, that's a good point. You're, we feel that the data says a titer at any point between one and three years and a boost accordingly. Um, I think the reason, I'm, I'm sure that the reason that we, we made it a specific time point was that the table was starting to look a little crazy where we were like, well, this person gets every six months, this person every two years titers, and then we get these people, you can get a titer at any point within this time period. You can get a booster at any point. It just seemed like the ranges were a little out of control. And so really the only reason that we chose two years was so, because it was the same number as for the number two risk group. Um, so we certainly could change that. So um, this is... Uh, who who was who was that? Dr. Fry. So oh, yeah. I, I just this is Karen. Uh, I just wanted to also comment uh, to, to answer that question that um, we do know also if a person has an elevated titer uh, at one or two years, it, it will typically uh, last out to three years or longer. To give some comfort to that two year period of titer checks and vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Um, uh, Brian Baxter is on the line and can give us information about the cost of the vaccine. Dr. Baxter, do you wish to go ahead and answer? While we, we're, we're going to try to get um, Dr. Baxter on, in the meantime, uh, let, let me have uh, Dr. Kimberlin uh, ask his question. Thank you, David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. And I, you know, I, so thank you very much for, um, for for laying out, I think, the rationale, which as best I can tell, the rationale is fewer is better. Um, I believe that, it, and I need to really digest everything we've been saying today, but I believe we're talking about studies that combined had either 263 or 410 subjects, something like that, uh, in them. Have there, have sensitivity analyses been done to see um, you know, what if when you multiply that into the thousands or tens of thousands, um, whether the 100% um, con zero conversion that was that was seen in those two studies really holds up in larger trials? Uh, no, we haven't done anything like that. We saw 100% and uh, took it as 100%. 
So, you know, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use an, an extreme example, but if, if it was an N of three and it was 100%, we wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that necessarily. So just trying to think of, of people's comfort level with a few hundred people making this kind of a change. Okay. We, this is Sharon. We didn't do that, but um, the confidence confidence interval was extremely tight for the two studies that were demonstrated. Yes, uh, Dr. Cohen would like to say something. Um, I just want to comment that uh, we've had a couple of um, outreaches from companies regarding um, the pricing that has been discussed. So uh, we will, um, we're going to give people a minute to uh, see if any of the companies want to comment. Um, but I do think that um, those numbers will be rechecked and um, presented at the next meeting if the companies allow. Um. Um, so um, let's go forward and uh, have Dr. Talbot uh, ask her question. Uh, I, so this past year has been very um, enlightening <laughs> in many ways, but one of them was just how fragile our healthcare system is. So I think one of the reasons I'm struggling with this decision is why not go ahead and give that third shot while we have them in case they don't get it again in the future. Um, and I think it relies on that serology data that you showed, but you only have serology data for three years. Is there any way to get more data beyond three years? Yeah, so we're hoping that given uh, WHO has instituted this um, this recommendation for 07 and, and um, assume that that provides long-term immunogenicity, that there's going to be data for that soon since their, their recommendations went into effect a few years ago. But... Um, our thought is that going forward, we would be able to collect data if this recommendation is accepted by ACIP and know whether or not this tighter booster is even needed um, and could drop everything, well, what's highlighted in this second column for the number three risk group entirely because we'd be sure that beyond three years they have that long-term immunogenicity. This idea of long-term immunogenicity was not um, was not of concern to WHO, and it was it's really our work group who, out of an abundance of caution and wanting to ensure that there is definitely data, um, did not feel comfortable making the recommendation without the data, and the data is not there right now. And I guess that's my question. Why are we in a hurry? Why can we not wait for the WHO data? Um, if it well, is 100% fatal disease, why can't we wait until that data is available? Well, we with this option for the number three risk group, we are we are allowing them to get the booster dose as soon as day 21, which is the same as the current three dose series. So what that amounts to is that if people want to get that want to get the three dose series, they they can. Um, but we know that it isn't always convenient for people to get that third dose. It, it isn't always needed because they're not going to have a risk beyond three years. And the cost is such that people aren't being compliant with the, the prep, the, the recommendation to even get prep because it's so expensive and it's out of pocket for them. And, and so I guess our thought was that we are allowing for people to continue to get it the way that they're currently getting it, but we're also giving them other options um, to hopefully improve the number of people who get it and um, uh, accommodate, I guess, for, for different preferences. And so we don't see a downfall, this, I guess. This is Sharon again. And we also, you know, I mean, they also have these scheduled tighter checks that they're supposed to be getting, that are supposed to be getting done. And if they're, if they get them done, um, they will, you know, there's oversight. It's not like they're out on the limb without any oversight. So let me, um, I understand that uh, Dr. Baxter is on uh, at this time. So uh, Dr. Baxter, if you want to offer some comments about the, the cost of the vaccine, um, the, the floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go forward. Okay, good. Um, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor, so, um, uh, so uh, thank you for that, though. But I uh, just wanted to reference the market research on the overall cost. And we can share these studies. And this market research was done over major cities in the US for pre-exposure prophylaxis per dose. Average cost was around $450 uh, per dose on an average cost. And we can share that uh, market research data if you would like. 
Thank you. That would be helpful. Okay. Sorry, which vaccine is that for? So I'm with Bavarian Nordic. So we have uh, Ravivir with the market yeah. research with general market research across across the U.S. for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Okay. I don't know if Dr. Wallace, our SME, is on the call. Dr. Wallace, are you on? I am. Was that the cost for the vaccine or for the vaccine plus visit plus consumables? That was cost for uh, $450. That was cost for, for a vaccine, not including visit. Yeah, there's not, uh, not in an emergency room setting. Correct. Yep. Um, the, the I, I think the I'm sorry to interrupt. Of, so I think what we can do is rather than, than taking a deep dive into this issue of the cost, uh, factoring everything in, we can do that offline and we can work with Dr. Rao to get that all, uh, all together. But I think the information you've given us that the average vaccine cost for Rabovert at least is $450 and that allows us to, to, to settle our, our, ourselves at this point. But we will take you up and we will look into this um, with regards to all costs related to this particular vaccine. Do you have anything else to say? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that was fine. It was just from um, just from the market research that we would be glad to uh, to share. Thank you very much. Next question is Dr. Bell. Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to make um, two um, quick comments. First is on this topic of the WHO recommendation for the two dose series, and I'm wondering if, in addition to waiting for studies, um, it would be useful just to check in with WHO. Presumably, you would know if there had been any breakthrough infections in the intervening time, but the advantage or disadvantage, depending on your perspective of the WHO environment, is that there are people uh, getting exposed every day to rabies. Presumably, most of them are haven't gotten pre-exposure prophylaxis, so it would seem like it might be worth looking into that, given people's concerns. And the second thing, um, just to say with the anticipation at some time that um, we're gonna come to a vote, and I know you're gonna tell me that this isn't part of the vote, but I agree with Dr. Paling's comment about, well, two years, but then what if they missed the two years? Couldn't it be up to three years? By attempting to simplify this table, you may in fact be setting yourself up for all kinds of additional questions from people when they miss the two year time point for the tighter check. So that's just an observation. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Uh, thanks. I just, you know, to get back to Kip's question, I just wanted to, um, and I might have missed this, but if it's a recommendation, why are there out-of-pocket costs if, if someone has insurance? Yeah, well, We can we can discuss that uh, at greater depth um, offline. I think at this point is is the recommendation. Yeah, we'll bring that um, to the next meeting and present um, a couple of slides about um, the cost summaries and and uh, reimbursement and things like that. Thanks. Thank you. So um, I think that ends all our presentations today. Thank you very very much, uh, Dr. Rao for for carrying the last three. Um, and thank you all uh, for participating um, actively um, and asking very uh, good questions. Um, so um, tomorrow uh, we have our final session, which is exclusively uh, dedicated to COVID uh, vaccine and disease. And uh, we will begin at 10 in the morning. Uh, for those of you here in Atlanta, drive safely um, and watch for fallen wires. Everybody else be safe and we'll see each other in the morning. <laughs>